instructions. Um, I just have a couple quick announcements. So the first is that we have the grand opening of the Peck exhibit this past Saturday at the Peck Center. Um, it was a really successful event. Um, if you haven't heard, it's a new permanent exhibit about the history of Peck High School at the Peck Center, um, which was Fernandina's African American school during segregation. Um, so it's now open to the public Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to please do so. As for upcoming programs here, our September brown bag lunch on September 7th will be with Rebecca Dominguez Carini, who will speak about the oral history project she's undertaking to collect stories from Northeast Florida's Hispanic residents. And then our September 3rd on 3rd on September 16th will be a um, temporary exhibit opening. And that exhibit is called Franklin Town, the South End's African American Legacy. Um, the exhibit will examine the history of Franklin Town, which was a community of free um, black Amelia Island residents starting after the Civil War. The exhibit opening will feature a panel of previous Franklin Town residents speaking about their memories growing up there. When is that? Uh, September 16th at 6 p.m. Um, so that's it for announcements, but tonight we have Calvin Bryant. Calvin is a passionate student of history who has studied the life of Jean Ribot and the French Huguenots. He is the founder and editor of JeanRibot.org, a highly rated website focused on preserving the true history of this amazing man and his legacy. So everyone, please welcome Calvin. Thank you. I appreciate you welcoming me here, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you on a nice evening. And uh, the rain seems to have stayed away on uh, this part Northern Florida over in Jacksonville, not so much. <laughs> so I'm just glad I made it here on time because uh, the weather was a little crazy. But thank you again for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, how many of you have kind of been in the North Florida area for a while and know a little bit about the history? Okay, good number. How many are brand new to the area? Okay, that gives me a sense of kind of who I'm talking to because uh, we all know that we're rapidly growing in North Florida. So uh, it's just nice to know where everybody's coming from. We have a wonderful, wonderful heritage here uh, in North Florida that is under great threat of being suppressed and lost. And I actually just had somebody ask me uh, how long have I had the website jeanrebeau.org which is kind of our flagship uh, site regarding this. And I uh, shared we've had it for about two years. And one of the reasons why we started it was there was a woke culture craziness going on about how Jean Rebeau was this terrible historical figure, and he's not. And uh, not that all historical figures are perfect, by no means, none of us are. However, uh, they were trying to attribute that John Rebeau had owned slaves and different things like that, and he did not. And in fact, he did not promote slavery at all or enslave any native people uh, during his time here uh, in North Florida or early America at that time, of course. And so it was part of that that kind of got the uh, righteous indignation up on uh, in this uh, a little bit, and we said, you know, it's time to use some of the resources that we have to make the record straight and to correct it. And so I own a digital agency, and so I got my uh, website people to build a website. I got copywriters to start writing articles. I got uh, Google search experts to start optimizing it. And so now when you search on Google, who is Jean Rebeau, we are in the top five responses that you get. And the idea there was obviously it's a great historical record for us to enjoy, you know, if you're just curious, but also for students and people who are writing papers, there's lots of resources there. We've linked to original documents in the Library of Congress. Uh, we have artwork, visuals that they can use. I don't copyright any of it to the extent that people can use it for, you know, uh, uh, reasonable purposes. 
And so it's a resource to do what we want to do. It's not ignore history. And uh, bad history is not history that should be ignored. It should be history that's learned from. And good history sh should not be history that's ignored uh, just because one of us may not like it, or you may like it, and I don't like it. That's, that's not uh, how America works, or it shouldn't work. And so uh, we are very fortunate enough in a wonderful man like Jean Rebeau to really have a great character of history who really embodies a lot of uh, values and characteristics of courage and honor and uh, a very passionate, devout commitment to his faith. And all of these things that we admire in others, uh, even if we might disagree with them sometimes, you can always admire someone who really stands for what they believe. And uh, Jean Rebeau certainly was that. Uh, so that's kind of the, let me get my clicker clicking over here. Uh, that's kind of the, the background of the Jean Rebeau Heritage Society. Uh, it's not a big formal uh, organization. However, it is a collection of people who just want to preserve uh, the story in a proper way, as well as document it in a way that others can enjoy it in a digital age. And so, who is Jean Rebeau? Jean Rebeau, 16th century or 1500s, I like to say, because some people get confused when you, you start saying 16th and you mean 15s. So let's say the 1500s. And the 1500s was an incredible century. Uh, if you're a student of history like me, it is phenomenal how you just stumble upon amazing events uh, from theology uh, through a history of exploration, uh, exploration and from Europe and early America. The 15th century was an incredible time of change, an incredible time of conflict and war where cultures were really duking it out, if you will. <laughs> They were battling for supremacy of ideas, and the age of exploration was in, in, in full uh, momentum. And we see a lot of wonderful characters rise and fall, and a lot of great people and cultures uh, uh, competing for dominance uh, economically, theologically, uh, sociologically, uh, lots of big words there. Uh, <laughs> But there, it's just a wonderful time to reflect on it and learn from it and study it. And Jean Ribot is smack dab right in the middle of all of it. And so Jean Ribot is a French Huguenot. He's a, a colonizer, he's a navigator, he was a prominent man in the uh, uh, French naval forces. He rose to the rank of captain and he was admired uh, all across Europe for being one of the leading navigators of his time. As we know at that time, the French Empire was very dominant. We have Spain, we have France, we have Germany. Uh, America was just starting to have the horizon. You know, the, the sun was just starting to peak over the, the mountains. And no one was quite sure where it would go and what it was, but they knew it was much different than where they were in Europe. Uh, and Jean Rebeau uh, was one of these men of his age that certainly uh, was smack dab in the middle of the turbulence of Europe and looked to America uh, for a solution to their challenges that they were facing. If I said the phrase, and for, uh, Forgive my Latin for if any of you are Latin professors. Or, uh, I know you're going to say, uh uh, buddy. Uh, lux lucet, uh, no, excuse me, post tenebras lux. Post tenebras lux. Who can, who can share? We have any ministers, any yeah. theologians, <laughs> any, any post tenebras lux? Lux. After darkness, light. After darkness, light. If you want to sum up the movement of who, who the French Huguenots were, you need to look to what we call the Protestant Reformation. 
a lot of modern America, uh, a lot of modern American history try to glaze over the significance of this event, but you cannot look at the 1500s without having a deep understanding of the Protestant Reformation to understand all the wonderful, tragic, uh, dark, uh, unfortunate, sometimes layers of the 1500s. And certainly when you speak about the French Huguenots, you cannot without reflecting on the Protestant Reformation, which took place in 1517. And we're going to explore a little bit of the background of Jean Ribot, his involvement, his life as a Huguenot, and, uh, and what that all means. Before we dig a little deeper on that, I want to put Jean Ribot in context. Fifty years before the Puritans landed at Plymouth, fifty, five decades before the Puritans hit Plymouth Rock, Jean Ribot came to the shores of America. Pretty profound. And there's a lot of reasons why we don't hear a lot about the French Huguenots in Florida. We'll touch on that. One of the reasons why is because they were completely destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> and we all know that you know, victory is written by, uh, history is written by the victors all too often. And so uh, the, the legacy of the French Huguenots, uh, or Huguenot, Huguenot, i uh, touch on that real quick, is the French way of saying Huguenot. Huguenot is the Anglo way of saying Huguenot. Uh, so the, the people I have studied on there always said the term Huguenot because they're so sophisticated. Uh, but I go back and forth just depending on, I don't know why. But I, if, if I interchange the terms, you'll, you'll know why. Sometimes I get French, sometimes I go back to English. But, uh, so 50 years before the Puritans uh, came uh, to, the, to Plymouth Rock, Jean Ribot and the Huguenots were down here in Florida. And to understand Jean Ribot and who he was as a man even further, you and we talked a little bit about being a Huguenot and the Reformation, we need to understand why Jean Ribot came. What were the motivations that brought him here? And I think that's a lot in history. We look at the, the end of the story a lot in a historical figure, but you really can't understand who that person is until you reflect on their journey, the influences, the, the cultural uh, influences, the economic and, and theological uh, religious influences of the day. So what we have as we look into the Protestant Reformation, as I mentioned in 1517, the Protestant Reformation, uh, prior to 1517, the world was dominated by, uh, as far as Christendom, two major uh, divisions of Eastern and Western Christendom. Orthodox side, uh, is the eastern side. We really don't hear tons of it because European history is dominated by Western Christianity. So we hear uh, a lot about the Roman Catholic side of things, the popes. And so Roman Catholicism dominated the European landscape of the day. By the time the 1500s had rolled around, there was rumblings of people who were tired of the dominance uh, from a political standpoint. We we had a connection of church and state, so the church and the state were one, and it varied from Germany to France and the different countries. But that dominance of, of control, uh, there was some rumblings of people that wanted and needed change. On a religious and faith side, there was a real spiritual awakening taking place uh, called uh, uh, due to people realizing that they could read the scriptures for themselves, they, could, they didn't need to go through a pope or a priest uh, to connect with God and find salvation, but that the Protestant Reformation uh, was started essentially when, uh, by an act of Martin Luther, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. I don't want to dive too deep in, because we only have an hour. I could probably talk about three hours just on that subject alone, of course. But we see uh, our, our, our good man here, Martin Luther in Germany, was a, a monk who challenged the uh, dominance of the Roman Catholic Church of his day uh, with his thesis that he uh, theses that he nailed to the Wittenberg door. 
And I have a little animation here that shows the starting of the Reformation in Germany and that message starting to spread to the hearts of people across Europe. And it was a vast spiritual awakening that impacted people of all classes. And one of the most significant things that was happening was the, uh, the development of the printing press allowed the Bible, the scriptures, to be printed and mass produced. So people for themselves, for the first time, were reading things in the Bible that were much different than what were being told to them uh, at a lot of different religious organizations, uh, specifically with the popes and the priests. And then in addition to that, there was a lot of financial corruption and uh, the selling of indulgences, excuse me, of indulgences. And so there was just a lot of upheaval of people being very discontented on a political level, but also on a spiritual level with what was going on in the world. So we see that it spread from Germany down into France, and some of these are a little past our timeline that we're talking here, and then eventually over to England and Scotland, and it literally has, is one of the most significant uh, historical events in modern history. Uh, well, really they consider the starting of the Reformation the beginning or the end of the medieval era and us uh, entering into more of a, a modern era. So this takes us to who the Huguenots or Huguenot are. Essentially, the Huguenots are people who embrace the teachings of the Reformation. And I actually had brought um, a little plaque that I think I left in my vehicle. And essentially, if how many are familiar with the five solas of the Reformation? Okay, so they're the five uh, through grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone, uh, uh, to the glory of God alone, through the scriptures alone. So sola scriptura is, is one of the most important ones. Um, and so there's five solas of the Reformation that basically were what people were embracing as uh, religious and faith teaching that was counter to a lot of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And that is where the Huguenots or the Huguenots were birthed from in France. They were groups of people that were embracing the teachings of the Reformation and turning their back on Roman Catholicism. Well, as you can imagine, the people who were in control, like all parties in control, what's the number one thing they don't want to lose? Is power. control, power. That's right, and we see it all the time in our own politics. It's just, it's gloves are off, there's no rules, everybody goes like cats and dogs and eat each other, uh, eat each other alive. And we see that back then as well. So we see that France in its day was very much dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. And there was three dominant families in France at the time. And the Huguenots were basically it's a slang name that was given to them. Like a lot of uh, groups, it starts off as a derogatory thing. And then eventually people don't even know what it meant as a bad thing. And they embrace it as their name. And so uh, the term Huguenots, and there's a lot, I'm not even going get, to get into where it came from, because there's all these different theories. They used to meet at night, and it means ghost, and you know, people who met in secret. Uh, but nonetheless, the Huguenots were uh, people of faith who embraced the teachings of the Reformation. Some names that you might be confused about that are also called the Protestants of the day. The Huguenots were called Protestants, French Calvinists, Evangelicals. French Reform, Lutherans. Now, it, they call them Lutherans because the Spanish called anybody who embraced the Reformation a Lutheran, even though technically they were not Lutherans. Um, and then Reformed Church. But they were based in France. And this is a painting uh, I painted um, uh, a couple years ago, I think. Now my wonderful wife's back there. I'm looking at her for a a nod, yes. Uh, <laughs> this is John Calvin. I painted him because that's what I'm named after. Ah. So it, 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 it was an ego thing, you know? It's kind of like, oh yeah, he must be important. I must paint him. Uh, 
But nonetheless, my father's a theologian, so I'm named after John Calvin. My brother's named after John Wesley, oh, wow. if you're familiar. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so we're all got these cool little theological names. Um, but essentially, John Calvin was, he took the teachings of the Reformation in Germany and brought them into France. And he was a very, and still is a very, one. Uh, I think Time Magazine years ago listed him as one of the top 25 most influential men in uh, world history. Uh, and you can dive into that, it's a great study, just amazing uh, influence of understanding philosophy, theology, it goes back to Augustine, and a, a lot of great things that we know and, and influence our culture today. So the Huguenots uh, are called by many names and reflected on by, uh, with many names. Now in France, the political leader of the Huguenots was Gaspard de Coligny. <laughs> and there's lots of you could get. It's one of those French anglicized names. You can say it French. Uh, I've been taught it's Coligny, but who knows? <laughs> uh, but some say Coligny. Uh, however you choose to pronounce it, that is the man. And essentially, he comes from royal blood. And so the Reformation, when it hit France, as I mentioned, it was a multi-tiered, uh, it was accepted by all classes of society. Uh, there was people who accepted it in all classes of society. Uh, Gaspard de Coligny is one of the leading figures in France. Obviously, if you're dressing like that, you have a lot of money. And, uh, and that's a real etching that someone made of him. So. That's quite impressive, but uh, so he had the money, the political power, the connections to the royal family, and essentially was a devout uh, Christian as well, uh, Protestant Christian as well. He is a, a, a key figure that you'll continue to see as we study Jean Rebaud. The Huguenot persecution, um, read a little of that as I speak. You can get some of the facts that show the magnitude of this. So it was sweeping across Europe, but specifically in France, because Jean Ribot is our topic tonight. We can see that in less than five years, almost two million people leave the Roman Catholic faith and embrace the, Protestant, the teachings of the Protestant Reformation. As a result, there's a power struggle. You know in those days, uh, murder and persecution uh, took a whole nother level often uh, too many times. And we're getting very close. Today's what, the 18th? 19th, thank you. Uh, today's the 19th. August 24th marks the anniversary of one of the greatest massacres of the 1500s, where over 40,000 Huguenots were murdered in cold blood over a 30 day period. Uh, now, it didn't happen until 10 years after our good man, Jean Rebaud, here, but there, there, there was a series of massacres, and uh, Catherine de' Medici, who was in charge and influenced all the royal family, she basically said it was open season, and they literally, in Paris, they killed 20,000 in Paris alone in just a couple of days. And uh, again, it's noted historically as one of the greatest massacres of the 1500s. It was a genocide against the Huguenots. That is the level of hatred and, and the struggle of power that was going on. And we're talking nobles, carpenters, fishermen, average people, high-ranking politicians. Uh, the Huguenots represented the cream of the crop in a lot of sense of France. And when uh, later on past the, the era of Jean Ribot, the a lot of Huguenots were forced to come out of hiding and completely leave France. And uh, historical records use the term that France was bled dry because a lot of the intellectual and financial, the financiers, a lot of the, the, the brain power of France left. And uh, so the Huguenots, the nobles and common people alike are murdered on the streets and in churches while they worship. And one of the big, uh, well, let, let me touch on this before I get to the, the massacre that essentially was the launching point of Jean Ribot in his journey. So in France at the time, there's three major families. Okay, we have the Guy, the Valois, and the Bourbon. These logos, this represents papal authority. This represents the ruling family who is kind of a moderate Roman Catholic uh, dynasty. These guys are very, very committed to Roman Catholicism and keeping the pure, true 
Roman Catholic faith, and then the Bourbons are represented by men like Collini and the more Huguenot reformed uh, side of the faith equation. So these three families are in conflict. And so because of this conflict, not, not too different than a lot of our <laughs> world today, even in America, uh, the names can change, but we could probably figure out a couple of nice little diamonds of conflict there too. <laughs> um, but this shows you the, the power structure that was going on in France at the time. And so all of this pushed by the Protestant Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church is losing control. We have various families in France that are committed to either <coughs> preserving Roman Catholic dominance these guys are in charge. They just want to keep the peace so they can make lots of money and keep everybody happy. The, the Bourbon, uh, 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 Collini, and his crew, they're trying to uh, come into power and promote uh, the, the uh, ideals of the Protestant Reformation. So out of that, we have the first massacre that leads up to Jean Ribot uh, coming to the shores of America. It's called the Massacre of Vassé, or Vassy, or however you want to say it. Uh, again, another one of those words. And we, it was the first time that the Guy family were given permission by Catherine de' Medici to go and bring the hammer down or the sword down on Huguenots and try to stop this surge of Protestant spiritual awakening that's going on in France. So uh, some say they were in a barn worshiping, some say they were actually in uh, a church. But nonetheless, they uh, soldiers were sent by the Guy family, the Duke, <coughs> Duke of Guy, and they slaughtered 300 of them. And the level of massacre is highly unusual because they didn't just do it for a day. They, the the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which comes up on the 24th, they hunted them for 30 days. It went on for a month. And it spread out of Paris, of course, and then went to the countryside. They stalked and hunted these poor dear people. The uh, Massacre of Vassé was just a couple of days because it was a smaller area and didn't reach the scale. But it was the first time that the powers, the government in control, the powers in control brought bloody persecution down on the Huguenots. So as a result, we're seeing a lot of aggressive behavior by those in the power structure in France against the ideals of the Protestant Reformation and the Huguenots who embrace them. Thus, this leads us to escape to America. So we see why Jean Ribot now comes to the shores of North Florida and we'll get into his three journeys a little, a little deeper. But this is the motivation of why they were coming. They were indeed seeking refuge from religious persecution. And because they were people of means, they had wealth, they had education, they had prominence in their society, they weren't beggars. They could show up and start their own communities. They, they, had, they were very successful people on every level. And I think if you know early American history up in New England, certainly a lot of the, the heritage, and maybe many of you here have Huguenot uh, people in your heritage that you can uh, point to. So this brings us to Jean Ribot coming to America. And this map gives you a really good idea of how the power structure worked. So ultimately, we're going to get into three voyages. We have Collini, who's the leader of the Huguenots in France, at the center of it. He is the, he's the power broker that has influence with uh, Charles IX. Now, at this time in France, there was, if you study who was in control, there was like sons dying, a new guy coming in, sometimes for a short period of time, and they're all named Charles or, or Guy. Uh, it's just, or, you know, there's like three names, and they all call their kids the same name, so you... But there's like a real interchange of about three or four different main characters. But this gentleman is the one that had the influence at the time. And he was highly influenced by Collini. 
in the royal family. They had the money, the power, and the influence to authorize that the Huguenots needed to find a home to escape the persecution in France. And they looked to America. They also looked to South America. And that's kind of a, more of a, another story, but there's an attempted colony in South America where there's still remnants there in a monument to the Huguenots. But they were looking for places to bring groups of people to basically start again and worship God as they saw fit. And so Collini initiates the authority of the great navigator Jean Ribot because he's the top naval officer, the top explorer, the top navigator in France, and he's a Huguenot. He turns to him and says, will you go? And so that brings us in 1562 that Jean Ribot leads an expedition to the New World to find, and he's basically on a scouting mission on this first journey, to scout potential locations for Huguenot Christians to eventually come in larger groups and settle in the New World of America. He explored the whole southeastern coastline, the, the southern uh, coast of the southern United States. He came in. I don't know if I have that one. <clears throat> I have an, an animated map that shows it on the website. I don't think I included it here. He did not. But he leaves, leaves France, comes down, hugs the coast of Florida, explores the coastline of Florida, and we have the River May, which is now called the St. John's River, and some dispute that. I know you may have some historical guys that say, oh, no, no. There's, there's a couple of people that say that is not the right river. Um, <laughs> and so there's a little debate going on there, and it's a really good debate, actually. They have some excellent, excellent points to make. But nonetheless, he explores the southern coastline of, uh, of northern Florida, and, uh, excuse me, he's the southern United States and the northern, uh, the eastern coastline of what is now Florida, and then goes up to South Carolina, and eventually uh, settles in, in uh, oh my goodness, I just was about to, Paris Island, thank you. <laughs> Paris Island, where they, essentially they, they obviously documented all of the different areas that were suitable uh, locations, and then in Paris Island they did make a small settlement. But we have, we're going to be looking at the three voyages. Now, in the second voyage, his second in command is René Ladonnier. He will lead the second voyage because our good man Jean Roubault on his return trip gets caught up in the wars in France and gets stuck in jail in the Tower of London. And so he couldn't come back. Our good man Collini's like, we got to go back. We got to go back. Who better to send than his second in command, René Goulon de la Vinaire, and then and we're going to look at the third voyage where Jean Ribot is released uh, from prison in England and leads the <coughs> voyage, his final voyage, uh, which is really the most exciting. Uh, it reads like a great storyline. I don't know if they'll ever make a movie about it, you know, but it, it's pretty awesome. You know, we, have, we have faith, we got war, we've got empires. And the two characters that are going to develop now that we're leaving the Reformation, okay? You know, it's obviously there in the background. The influence of, of our, our good man John Calvin there, and ultimately uh, the teachings of, of the Bible. And they're leaving France and they're coming to America. And we're, who are the two main characters? Well, we have Pedro Menendez, who's a very famous guy. And I see a lot of heads shaking. That's good, good, good. But so we have France, we have Spain, we have two empires that are at war with each other in a power struggle to dominate trade in the Caribbean and in, and in Europe. Okay, so we have that layer. Cool. We got another layer. We've got that faith layer where the influence of the Reformation, of the, the teachings of the Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church, Spain is Roman Catholic. France is in flux. It's Roman Catholic, but obviously the Huguenots are there and being pushed out and persecuted. <clears throat> so we have that layer. 
Then we have the layer that in America, we've got Native Americans, we've got a new world, we have this whole thing. How do you survive in a place that you've never been before? And they're coming on these vast <laughs> journeys across the ocean. And, uh, and so they're exploring uh, the southeastern coastline of the United States. And so we have this great story starting to unfold. And so in 1562, our man Jean Ribot comes down. He's finding uh, uh, Charles Fort, which is founded in Paris, South Carolina. And one thing I like to talk about, because it's very uh, popular and rightfully so topic, is relations with the native people when they came here. We all know tons, a lot of horrible stories um, that are sad and tragic. Uh, one wonderful note about Jean Ribot is, and this is what promoted my next painting, <laughs> is Jean Ribot forged excellent relationships with the native people. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, um, I think he genuinely was that kind of person. But number two, there were probably 100 people coming into a land that was full of millions of Native Americans who were here with weapons and chiefs that were powerful military leaders. Common sense would say, don't make the powerful guy with, with all the military power mad. And so when, uh, and you know it's very common uh, when they come to explore new areas, they make peace, they exchange gifts with people in the power structure where they're going. Jean was no, Jean Rebeau was no different. So let's attach this to some local areas. So if you are familiar with Jacksonville, there's St. John's Bluff, there's the St. John's River, all of that is the early arrival spots of Jean Ribot and those three uh, journeys. They explored it. And on his first journey, when Jean Ribot came, there's a, a monument that they would erect, and the Spanish did it too, when they were down in St. Augustine. It was a common practice. You know, put your flag down. They make big stone monuments. There's a, uh, a replica of that monument down uh, in Jacksonville now. In the not Huguenot State Park, it is oh, Timaquan, Timaquan State Park. Thank you. And you can go see a replica of the fort. Um, and it's, is federal. Do you know where that is? That's National Park Service. Okay. Can you correct me then? Where where's the where's the monument? Do you know the, where the I do not know where the monument is, but the, the Timaquan Preserve, which includes Fort Caroline, okay. Kingsley Plantation, uh, something else, that's all National Park Service. Okay. So just if, if you go there, you can go about two miles up the road. That whoever owns it, I'm not sure. And thank you for your thoughts and comments there. Um, there is a, a replica of the monument there. It's beautiful. It's got big oaks around it. It's, it's, it's very attractive. I should have put a picture in it. Um, but you can go see it. And it's wonderful. And it's got all the French uh, markings on it and the story and line. And it's, it's quite awesome. And it overlooks St. John's Bluff and overlooks St. John's River. So. At this point in history, there are some historical things that you can go visit here locally. Um, so Jean Ribot establishes good relations with the local native people. And unlike the Spanish, who would come very shortly after, down in St. Augustine, he didn't come for gold and he didn't bring slaves. Um, they came as the settlers and tradesmen, uh, and they came to scout these locations for Huguenot Christians to uh, find a place to live. I have to show you these graphics because we took a lot of time to make them. <laughs> <laughs> so say, look at the pretty pictures. <laughs> All right, you know that? See that where it came from? And we are getting these names from uh, the his, a lot of the historical records. Uh, we've reviewed them a few times. Some of them are, you know, when you re review historical documents, some might have certain things in it, other ones don't. They spell it different. So I'm noticing some of the names are kind of all over the place as far as with the native chiefs and things like that. So, But I know his name is right. <laughs> <laughs> and for today, that's the most important. Um, so. Contrary to a lot of popular opinion, 
Fort Caroline was not founded by Jean Ribot. Paris Island ended up being abandoned. Uh, Jean Ribot, after he founded uh, the, the fort in uh, Paris Island, and I'm sorry, that name just slipped my mind again. Can you believe it? But he had to go back to France to resupply and bring back more uh, colonists. He was supposed to be the second voyage. And because when he went back to France, he got stuck in the wars. And as I mentioned, he got captured. So René uh, Goulon de Laudonnière, he comes back, finds Fort Caroline abandoned. Uh, not Fort Caroline, excuse me, Paris, the fort in Paris Island abandoned and goes back to some of the locations they scouted on their first journey and founds Fort Caroline that we know today. So Jean Ribot did not found Fort Caroline, but uh, Le Damier did, and he is a, he's a tremendous character as well. Now, he came back, he continued to build on the relationships with the native uh, leaders that were forged during the first journey. And so in 1564, um, we see the development of Fort Caroline. And we can see here that, I mean, you're all local, so it, this is not any, a, a difficult map for you to wrap your mind around. A lot of people are surprised how close together you know, a lot of these things are. Um, and it's a nice map. <laughs> And so this brings us to the third voyage of Captain Jean Ribot. Now, the French wars of religion are raging back in Europe. And so a lot of these Huguenot colonists that are coming to America, in addition to being tradesmen and people of means, a lot of them are battle-hardened veterans. And they are tough dudes, as, including the Spanish. So what we see is uh, Spain continuing to develop its resources and its claim. And St. Augustine was a point to protect the trade routes down to the Caribbean and the gold ships and the treasure ships that are coming up. So when they found out that Jean Ribot was had come and was coming to uh, the shores of America, they didn't, the, the powers that be, the kings and queens that were in charge, didn't see a guy looking for religious freedom. They saw France coming down to build a fort. And in all fairness, that patriotism piece, I'm sure, was there. I don't think you can completely separate them. I mean, it'd be like saying if you're a devout Christian and you go somewhere for whatever reason, would you stop being an American patriot? You'd still have that American patriotism in you. And so uh, that factor was certainly there, and uh, but it wasn't the dominant reason why Jean Ribot uh, was sent by Collini to come on, the, on, on any of the voyages. So we see here in 1565, this third voyage of Jean Ribot. He's released from prison. He's very well funded. That uh, Charles has given them a big financial grant giving them a lot of money, ships, soldiers, supplies, everything. So Jean Ribot is coming on this third voyage. They're battle-hardened, they're war-sensitive. These guys are at the top of their game coming from France. One thing you gotta understand about the Huguenots is they were not ultra-passive. Because they were people that were at the center of a lot of culture in France, they were very much, I'm gonna defend my home. You are not going to take my business. You are not going to hurt my family. I will defend my home. That is the attitude that they had. But they lost. They were defeated. They were massacred. But when they did raise military force in France, which they did, they were defeated in battle. So these guys are coming. The Huguenots are coming on the Rabot in the third journey. And uh, I'm going to read this to just get the facts completely straight. Um, we have seven ships, three of which are smaller than 100 tons, and four which were greater. The flagship is La Trinité, commanded by Jean Ribot. How many have heard that they have discovered the wreckage of La Trinité? They have, and so, and it's quite awesome. Where? 
um, off the coast of St. Augustine, Florida. It's, and you'll, you'll see why in the next slide. There's something about wind and waves. And, 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 so they're coming with an armada of ships, soldiers, supplies, settlers, everything. The Spanish under Pedro Menendez send their guys up, realizing that the French are on their way, and now we have an arms race, we got a, a battle going on. You literally have an overlap of Pedro Menendez and his fleet racing to Florida, and Jean Rabot and his fleet, just like a half a day ahead of them, racing to Florida. And it's, it's, it's quite awesome. And if the history books are accurate, and we all know that you know they, they can exaggerate a little bit here and there, and sometimes everywhere. Uh, <laughs> but they literally arrived in Florida one day apart. Jean Rebeau's fleet got here first. They dropped some settlers off at Fort Caroline, realized the Spanish were coming. Again, remember, Coming from the wars of religion in France, these are battle-hardened soldiers, and they're well-equipped with military personnel. They realize if we don't act strategically, the Spanish may come and get the strategic advantage and, and destroy us. His commanders, Rene uh, Ladonniere being one of them, cautioned that they should not leave Fort Caroline and go and preemptively strike against the Spanish in St. Augustine where the fleet was heading. Jean Ribot overrode him and they decided, they got here just about a day earlier, that they were going to stay in their ships and grab the majority of their men and head to St. Augustine to try to stop the Spanish before the Spanish had the chance to attack them. That fateful decision is a critical game changer in the legacy of what happened to Jean Ribot and the Huguenots in Florida. If he would have stayed, as you'll see, things may have been a lot different. But that is the, the motivation of, of why he went and the conflict that was going on there. So this great armada, Some call this an act of God. If you're a faith person, you could say sovereignty. If you're a Roman Catholic, you would say God was on our side. Uh, however you choose to frame this history, as Jean Ribot coming to the New World, they finally get here, sends his fleet and his soldiers down to attack, this, uh, preemptively strike the Spanish fort in St. Augustine. A tropical storm whips up, wipes out the fleet. And John Ribot and his men are shipwrecked and wash up on the shores uh, somewhere near Daytona Beach, Matanzas, St. Augustine. I'm just going to say St. Augustine area for they don't really know exactly. Obviously, it's a storm. It could it could be a 20 mile uh, line of wreckage. Uh, but they wash up. The great our military armada is completely wiped out. I mean, completely wiped out. So they came in strength, an act of God wipes out the Huguenots, the French, and oddly enough, who shows up not too long? The Spanish get there. S sun is shining. <laughs> it's a beautiful day, and they cannot believe the good fortune that they've had, that this great French army that was coming to destroy them, in fact, gets wiped out, and they happen to come upon the survivors of this wreckage. They estimate around 300 or more survived, which shows you how many soldiers and people were, were French Huguenots that were going to attack. And there's a monument there. This is obviously a picture of one of the historical markers. It's our good man, Pedro Menendez. This is good old John. You'll know why his head is bleeding in a minute. <laughs> I think you kind of get where I'm going with that, hint, hint. Um, but 
we have Jean Rubeau with 300 of his men get washed up on the shores near Daytona Beach. Uh, Pedro Menendez, uh, hearing of where they are from native peoples who report to him, <coughs> sends a contingent and goes up there, captures them, and gives them an opportunity to either renounce their faith or die. And this is a big part that's left out, but it's very prominent in the historical records and uh, the diaries and things that are written about these events. That if they would convert to Catholicism, they would be spared. Uh, and if they didn't, they would be killed. Now, they drew, the Spanish drew them under a pretense that we'll let you go if you come peaceably and all this and we'll it was a, a tradition of the day that they would give ransoms for the, especially if you were wealthy, yeah. you could get a ransom for uh, your capture or trade. And uh, so Jean Ribot, 300, 300 of his men are captured and they are given the chance to renounce their faith or die. Several of them who weren't claiming to be Huguenots at all were spared and converted to uh, Catholicism. But Jean Ribot and all of his leading men chose to be executed. And Jean Ribot being the leader and renouncing any opportunity to convert or, or, or excuse me, to renounce his faith, they plunged it. I think I have this written down here. No, I have it at the end. Um, they stabbed him in the belly cut him open with a pike, and then they cut off his head. And then they took his body, quartered it, and posted it at the four corners of uh, the fort in St. Augustine. You don't hear a lot about that history. Uh, that's called the Matanzas Massacre. And some say that the numbers are even higher than 300, but you know how numbers can be with history. They can be up or down, depending on who's telling the story. Nonetheless, it was, it was a, a radical massacre and the diaries of Pedro Menendez record that he didn't kill them specifically because they were French, but because they were Lutherans. That's, that was so how much the hatred, we talked about the different layers of history that were active. We had the, the layer of empires. We do have the French and Spanish empires, but that layer of faith and religious fervor is certainly there as well. And the Spanish were dedicated to very restoring the power of the Roman Catholic Church, and Jean Ribot uh, represented that, in addition to being French. So we see this massacre. This is where the end of our wonderful friend Jean Ribot's life uh, ends with his head cut off on a beach somewhere near St. Augustine, Florida. Again, you can see some of these historical <coughs> markers that are there that record some of these uh, events and certainly uh, research it more online if you choose. Uh, on my website, jeanribaud.org, again, we have links to a lot of the historical re original records from that you can download from the Library of Congress and read them yourself. And very, very interesting. And you'll see a lot of overlap in what I'm talking about in this presentation from those documents. So Jean Ribaud, let's see if I got my facts right. No, he stabbed in the belly, had a pipe plunged into his chest, and then was beheaded. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Before we go into some of the questions that I'd like to answer, if you have any, um, the legacy of Jean Ribot is, is quite vast because what the Huguenots represented, what the ideals of John Calvin and the people that would follow Jean Ribot, what they represented have radically uh, impacted the history of the United States. Whether you like that or not, it is true. And Ribot uh, came to the New World to find religious freedom, but oddly enough, the very religious persecution he sought to escape in France followed him to the shores of the New World and cut off his head. Quite ironic, isn't it? He survived Europe and died in America. And Ribot's faith in Jesus Christ personifies the ideals of the Protestant Reformation 
and the Huguenot way of life. And for those of you who might be people of Christian faith, you can really identify with him and the character and the values that he stood so strongly and ultimately died for. His courage as an explorer and navigator encouraged many more generations of people to seek show, uh, refuge in the shores of America. Thank you for allowing me to share this. Before you start with the questions, if you have your car parked over at the theater, you need to move it now. Because they have a play going on and they will have it towed. Okay, questions. <laughs> Time is of the essence. Sure, can we just give a minute and let everybody leave and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to answer if I can. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when I went through Joseph training here, one of the things that, that we were told was um, that there were approximately a thousand people that came over with um, Jean yeah. Jean 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 no, with uh, Rene. Pedro? Rene. Oh, oh LaDonia? Okay. La yeah. Yeah. Yep. And um, that it includes women. And so that it's actually kind of fair to assume that the first European child might have been born at Fort Caroline a good, sure. a good 20 years before in the air up in Maine. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and there is a very strong uh, push to correct that whole Plymouth Rock you know, being elevated and uh, get some tourism down here, really. You know, but uh, for, maybe we don't want that kind of tourism. I don't know, but nonetheless, yes, ma'am, that absolutely is correct. And uh, we, there, when the Spanish attacked Fort Caroline, there were some survivors. And how do we know that history records every single person that survived or didn't? I mean, these guys, you've got a couple of people that survived, a couple of people that could read and write. A lot of people were illiterate that made any type of record. So it's it's very uh, reasonable to say if there was male and female that were down here and they were settling, well, of course, there would be a high probability of people having families and starting families and, and that taking place. Great question. Yes, sir. Yeah, speaking of families, a few minutes ago you were talking about the three families. Yes. Now, is that actually a bloodline? Uh, they were bloodlines. Really? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, in remember 1500s in Europe, all these families, you know, they were all the Habsburgs and all the, these bloodlines. They were royal families that ruled Europe, and certainly the Guy, the Bourbon, and the Valois were part of these royal bloodlines and uh, impacted history. You know, obviously continuing way past what we're talking about here today. But yes, three distinct royal families. Of, of family heritage. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is that Huguenot Park? What is there? Down there? The campground there? Is it an island or? No, 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 it's no, just it's a park. Jacksonville Park. City okay. Park. But it's, it's, there's beach, there's, I think there might be playground there. stuff. There is an actual campground there. You can actually go But the has it camp. any relation to? There's a museum down there where you can get some of the Yes. Yeah, and I think there's someone else echoing part of that why it was called Huguenot. That's all part of the early area they were exploring. And so they ultimately La Donniere came back and set up shop. But where the where the re replica fort is now isn't where the real fort was. There's a lot of again, some debate of where it is and where it wasn't. They just had some land and uh, decided to build it there to give some type of representation of the history here. Not, don't look at it as the literal place where the fort was. And so a lot of our wonderful friends uh, in these various areas claim that the fort and settlements were closer to where they were. So I think this whole area has that kind of stamp of Huguenot history to it. Yes, sir. Yes, um, question, you have Charles the Ninth being sort of in charge 
Catherine de Medici, I thought, was <laughs> the <laughs> regent at the time. Yes. That he went over. No. Yes, and this is where it gets, remember, I, we have like a lot of, like a stack of people in a closet like this, <laughs> all the royal family. So Charles the Ninth was the son of um, one of the Catholic royals, and Kalini was his educator, his mentor, yeah. and so they raised him up Protestant. And that, and he was young. He was very, very young. He was a Dauphine, wasn't he? I, I don't know. And she was, she was really regent at the time that he came over because he was too young to be the king at the time. And so she was in charge of so many things. Yes, because she was the one that ordered the St. Bar uh, Bartholomew's Day Massacre. She was the ultimate, and she had, when she wasn't absolutely in charge, she had the power of influence. Um, but the where Charles the Ninth comes into play is he was close enough to the top of the cherry on the Sunday that he had access to money and and power to uh, to give Kalini what he needed to, uh, to make the journey happen. And all the little details we could probably get into the nitty gritty. And your points are valid. Your points are valid. She certainly is the major figure there. But you'll see when you dig into it, there's like four or five little, it's like one guy dies, another guy's born, and he's the mentor of this guy, and then Captain Medici, uh, uh, Medici is certainly in there as a significant thing. And was he a Valois? He was Bourbon. He was, he was no, no, I mean the king, Charles the Third, Charles the Ninth. He died. Was he a Valois? Uh, Valois, I, I think he was Bourbon. I think he, he was, was Bourbon, bourbon. yes. But it, I don't. I, I can't give you 100 percent on that. I don't recall. I did know it one time. But you got to remember, this is the Reformation just happened in 1517, yeah. right? It and so, the, 1560s. correct. So there's still. I'm sure there was a lot of people in the Bourbon bloodline that weren't Protestant. You know, you st are still. You were talking to the physical people here, so we're all related. We're not necessarily all going to agree, even if the top. <coughs> The controllers of our family unit may be Protestant, <laughs> but we're going to have people who are atheists. You know, there's going to be people of all different walks. I, I, I would assume that dynamic was, was real there. So we still have some evolution. I think it would be great to dig a little deeper and get that answer, though. It's certainly there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sure, this is about 500 years after the Crusades, yeah. But it's this, it, your point's valid from the standpoint of that is the power structure of the Roman Catholic Church was in charge of Europe. So it was the same power structure that was behind the Crusades. They were in control, you know, and then you have this groundswell from the ground up of this Protestant, Reformation, this strange religion of people that are literally having spiritual awakening like revivals and churches and like it's a, a very spiritual movement but yes it's it's the same power structure but a little bit later quite a bit later actually yes sir the uh the infamous uh massacre or whatever you want to call it sure uh what happened to the french did they ever have a settlement uh uh you know is there a community or a place where uh they settled or were they fully wiped out and they never and they never uh yeah, so it, that ended any colonization of the southern United States with the Huguenots, and they didn't return until later, you know, up, up north, for lack of a, a better way to explain it. However, back in France, um, there was this great migration. And you'll see times of peace, you'll see different <laughs> uh, councils that were held and different things that were passed that were peaceful toward the Huguenots, and then another royal would come in and the Edict of Nantes, and they, then they revoked it, and, and then there would be, it was almost like the early Rome against the Christians, you know, there was, depending on who was emperor, they would set, speed them to the lines, and the next guy, he was cool with it, and don't ask, don't tell situation. Yeah. It was kind of like that in France for a while. However, ultimately, it led to the Huguenots, 
that I think there was two or three mass migrations uh, out into England, and a lot of the Puritan movements and all of that come out of people pushing out of France into England, and you know the Puritan movement is they used to call them hot Protestants. The Puritans at that time they weren't a, a denomination; it was a, a, a Protestant Reformation movement, a spiritual awakening. But it pushed into England, pushed into Scotland, where you have the Presbyterians, and a lot of that come out of the Huguenot heritage. So, and because John Calvin is such a juggernaut of influence, philosophically and theologically, uh, you can't really underestimate. Again, even if you don't like him, the influence that he had in a lot of these areas, and certainly uh, the the Huguenots were no exception. 